as I see it, it's soup to nuts. I mean, you know, today we spend most of our lives on our phone. So it's really about how do you provide that experience primarily through the phone, low level Bluetooth, drive in, drive out. I think as we see more electric vehicles and even automated vehicles, but from electric vehicle front, how do you bring in robotic charging capabilities within your facilities? Because, you know, the people that are going to be parking, they're going to be looking for one of those spots that have a EV charger in them. How do you get them out when they're done charging and get them out of their office? So moving into robotics in that sense. And then I think, you know, there's the wider look as well as, you know, we look at parking and uh, space. We have the on street or the curbside and we have the off street. And, you know, there's been a lot of alternative uses of that curbside space over the last couple of years as the city of Toronto looks to use it. So it's, you know, taking a look at AI for identifying how do we make it more efficient around the use of that curbside versus off street space and move people more away from the curb into the parking facilities that are off street. So yeah, it's it's a lot of fun going through it all. Uh, there's a lot of integration that we're looking at with the other um, agencies. So doing a bunch of work with the Toronto Police Services right now, primarily around enforcement and parking services that they offer and how do we move that over to us and how do we expand some of the services that they're doing, like towing, for example, and integrate that in with the um, Toronto Parking Authority Green P application. So a lot of fun stuff. We started our RPA journey about two years ago and we've been using an iterative crawl, walk, run approach to practice on small, less complex automations. And then we're using those learnings as an opportunity to build buy-in and, and graduate into more complex processes. So anything that could be documented as a process and repeated is a target. We've had great uptake by our finance teams, our HR teams, specifically around any activity that's reconciliation or payments driven. What we've learned, though, and that surprised us, is that we've had really fantastic adoption by both our employees and our leadership team using this learning approach. And for OMERS, this has not been a cost-based exercise. Instead, we've been concentrating on the benefit of giving time back by capturing uh, those tasks that might be repetitive and, and maybe a bit more mundane and replacing it with new and valuable work that we're engaging in. And then focusing on wellness as we return to a hybrid office. So what we've been hearing and capturing is that when work is automated, what specifically did we do with that time back? And one of our most impactful user stories has not been about adding work. In fact, it's been about reducing overtime work, has been reducing that crunch that happens at the end of a month whenever you're closing a month end or a quarter end, and simply using automation to reduce that type of work that then drives um, an emphasis on, on well-being and being able to contain our working hours within normal working hours in, in the day. So from here, we're going to jump off these data-driven analytics to validate our opportunities around intelligent automation strategies. And we've really found that building that buy-in and momentum by starting small and focusing on those meaningful outcomes has helped us to then get that buy-in and enthusiasm to move to more complex processes and use cases. Very similar focus areas around, you know, internally HR, finance, and integration with our partners. We're we're on the brokerage side of, of insurance, so we we work a lot with the a lot with the carriers. But it really is starting off with those small wins. And the way we talk about it internally, it's you know it's almost the, the pebble in your shoe, right? You know, everyone has them. You you walk. It, it's an annoyance, but really, it builds up over time and it drives inefficiencies into our world. So. So we've started with that. We have not gone down the RPA path, and I'd probably want to pick Monique's brain at some point on, on her experience, but um, but we're going with more of a workflow tool around Microsoft's Power Platform, which which allows us to do um, some more integration. So, But really, it's starting off with that focus on eradicating those pebbles in your shoes and you know building out from there. I would say that the, the key for us has been ensuring that we we have that backed by a good target architecture so that we don't lose sight of where we need to go because it's so easy to have you know fragmented solutions that come back and bite us with, with a lot of technical debt later on so coupling those two 
it's been it's been successful. I don't think we're at the stage yet where we're looking at artificial intelligence automation of it, but I think I think we'll we'll get there. We'll get there, but one one small step at a time. Yeah, so the, the, it's really the the journey we're taking from you know from sort of a static infrastructure to to a dynamic infrastructure, and the need for agility and transitioning to uh, you know sort of a dynamic setting. So there's two aspects of it. One is you know how do we automate deployment of infrastructure, uh, and I'm talking about infrastructure as code. How do we deploy uh, uh, repeatedly infrastructure? Uh, to realize cost savings, quality, reliability, and security of our infrastructure. So those are the kind of the drivers. So we've been implementing uh, 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 tools to enable that. And, and I can tell you, just imagine in the old world, uh, how long would it take, uh, you know, it's a question, how long would it take you to deploy over 160 components, including compute, network, and database? It takes us 20 minutes. So that's the value of uh, automation that we're realizing is speed, agility, and quality and repeatability uh, of uh, deploying infrastructure. When it comes to uh, you know agility from the business perspective, we're deploying new business services in a rapid manner. We've got automated pipelines that are de- deploying code, checking the quality of them without any, any interference uh, of uh, human interference. So. For us, automation has been very key in, in realizing uh, not only cost savings, but quality and, and agility of the way we deliver our business. When it comes to AI, AI has been very key on us to monitor and not reactively and not even proactively, but actually through behavioral analysis, determine how our infrastructure is performing and address those issues ahead of time. And we're starting to dabble into sort of self-healing Type infrastructures and and infrastructures that can scale out by themselves without our interference. Uh, so for us, automation and AI has been a core component of uh, of of our business model. Like any other shop, the digital transformation and modernization has been on the books for now quite a number of years. With that, we undertook and uh, looked at different platforms. Uh, one of the key things uh, was uh, onboarding ITSM environment. Uh, originally, it came up into the shop as ITSM, and over time realized how this is more focused on enterprise service management side of thing. So that's really helping us to automate uh, things all around us. The 19 different uh, org units within IT shop are leveraging that platform along with our HR department and also exploring now with building automation. Uh, side of things. So that's uh, that's one way. And I had talked about ITOA earlier also, how we're leveraging that platform uh, to help ourselves too when it comes to CSI. Uh, another piece uh, I wanted to touch base around the AI, we are not strictly investing in AI for the AI sake. We're leveraging some of these next generation tools and platforms coming on board, how they have baked in AI to leverage that. So with the minimum investment, we can get better ROI on our side. So those are the few things happening here at TDSP. We're really focusing on how automation and cloud and DevOps come together. So as we build out cloud, we're integrating infrastructure automation with DevOps, breaking down the traditional barriers between infrastructure automation and CI, CD automation. Um, We integrated Ansible platform to look at infrastructure as a service, including VM provisioning, um, environment automation, and database automation. So we're researching AI ops to do service automation to enable, as Mahmood mentioned, self-healing, predictive analytics, and proactive problem management. With our hybrid approach to cloud, we're leveraging automation in the public cloud to turn off and turn on our legacy apps that have no plans to modernize so that we only have them on when needed. Um, In addition, we're moving forward in our automation journey. Um, We are also working um, on something called Fit for Growth, which is really looking across the organization to start unpacking and delineating between work that is foundational Um, or enabling that's more of a commodity that we might be able to outsource in the future, work that we must do and and optimize, um, and differentiating work that'll make us market leading in the future. And this goes both to automation as well as the build versus buy decisions. 
infrastructure as code, pipeline, AI ops, predictive analytics that most people think about for uh, automation and AI, and certainly true. Uh, but ironically, the largest conversation I have been having of recent kind of connects the threads to what Monique was talking about and leveraging kind of robotic process automation around. Uh, and, you know, I'll speak to Michelle and, and her definition of DevOps more the operations team bringing validation capabilities to the development side in their test. And so as we kind of talk more, you know, that DevOps is really an amalgamation of the both. And I think generally people think of as developments taking over the operations function, but larger and more centralized IT teams are asking, what can we bring to the developers in order to help make this kind of more of a symbiotic relationship and each do our own best of test. Uh, I think, you know, we'd all agree developers are phenomenal at creating new capabilities uh, and largely they work inside of a walled garden where, you know, it's curated. They know what's going to happen inside their own laptop uh, and operations, you know, being an operations guy myself are phenomenally skilled at bringing in new complex requirements, new security techniques, et cetera, only to uh, expect that that developer's application is going to behave the same in that new sandbox. And so by bringing central IT knowledge uh, and awareness along with security's understanding of all the new static application, dynamic application testing techniques to the developers, uh, they can actually help detect errors quicker, faster, improve the fidelity of that code and actually have less issues in production by bringing that to them and, and finding those errors faster and quicker. <laughs>